Ну, ладно. Oh, all right. One man thought of his mind as a pocket radio. And while this did not shut it down, it did help remind him that what it was picking up, he wasn't transmitting. <laughs> For a mystic who knows far more than just your around the mill mystic should, there is no system, practice, discipline, or philosophy. Only him and his head. Okay, now that's the bad news. And okay, the great as well. <laughs> School is out, just in time for the few to learn. School is in, just in time for the few to learn. School is out, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. School is in, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Guess it don't matter for the few, few, few. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Our slogan of the day, neural consciousness is a terrible thing to waste solely on the mind. <laughs> See, said the mayor of Mysticville, here's the old problem Rooney. If no one locally knows what they're doing, then where does one turn for help? And immediately all who actually belong there fled. Ordinary men came up with the word justice so they'd have something to debate and argue about to help keep them from actually looking at the beast. You know what those who know hate most about justice? <laughs> that it only attacks them when they momentarily forget what they know. Why is there no place of punishment after death for those of the struggle? Because life can't think of anything more tormenting than what they've already been through. <laughs> that is, whenever they forget. That is. Herd psychology. The danger in running with cows is not simply that you begin to moo, but that you begin to believe that moo is all you can do. The vicinity of common neural perception, public transportation, and other mangled mixings of metaphors. When it comes to life's radio transmissions to your mind, it doesn't care where you sit, just as long as you ride the bus. Quiz game twixt two guys. <laughs> What'll wear you out a whole lot faster than living an ordinary mental life? Trying to be aware of it. And the first guy was surprised that the second guy finally got one. <laughs> A little truth in advertising insert. We should note that. Those actively struggling for a change in their condition of consciousness have another totally different concept of what being tired and worn out is. <laughs> Our slogan update for the day. A mind is a terrible th thing to waste simply on thinking. <laughs> Another chapter in the continuing story of the great conflict. One day the people, instead of attacking the king, decided to storm the village radio station, only to find that no one was there. <laughs> Man's consciousness, when it consists solely of the mind, is like a tree attempting to climb itself. At the request of his son, one man defined metaphors thusly. Metaphors are what you use when either you or your listeners, one, won't be able to bear up under the enormous strain of plain speak. The lad seemed to find this explanation satisfying, but when he turned to walk away, his father added, of course, due to the possible weakness of you or I, one, my response could have been allegorical. At which point the lad ripped off his school jersey to reveal underneath the uniform of Captain Irony, then promptly shot himself, down near to death, if not understanding. <laughs> Judgment. Metaphors are only dangerous if they apply to you. Judgment on appeal. 
all metaphors apply to you. <laughs> Morality revisited. Only those engaged in trying to bring the mind under conscious scrutiny ever have any right to feel ashamed. And they forget to try, of course. How to spot the most intelligent person at the mental level? Look for the fattest cannibal. Matters of court. If the sheriff shouldn't associate with thieves, nor the priest with pagans and the prince with traitors, where cometh the would-be conscious to mingle with the thoughts of their mind? After many years of moving along certain lines, one man's mind finally demanded of him, Why do you only pick on me? And he replied, Huh, you're the, organ I, you're the only organ I've got that I can do it with without suffering physical harm. That's why. <laughs> Just, just between you and me, this brings up an interesting question. How can a man be smarter than his own mind? Okay, one more thing. If you can't be smarter than your own mind, what reasonable asp aspirations can you ever have to be smarter? So I'm doing him. Another way you might spot those more neurally alive is that they never agree with anybody. But you'd never know it. <laughs> no beast takes thunder personally, except those in danger of being lightning struck. So why does man so uniformly do so regarding his thoughts? Screw rhetorical inquiries, I'll give you a damn answer. If your radio only picks up one station, how else are you going to take what you hear other than personally? Former hip phrase updated. Tune out, drop in, and welcome home. Finally. <laughs> Started to say how easily people forget things from the LSD culture, and I thought, well, the people from that culture forgot everything. Not just. <laughs> that was the whole point. <laughs> Me staying here spitting in the wind on myself. That is, that's a whole new definition of presumptuously stupid that I write one as a takeoff on a phrase from the dopey age and then sort of look, you know, chagrin that no one remembers it. And I thought, well, anybody that was alive and part of the age, I can't make fun of it because they don't even remember it. So where's that story about justice again? <clears throat> Proverb refurbishment. Maybe, perhaps a little better. Things are not merely simpler than they seem, seem, but even simpler than by the mind can be seen. Further refinement. Quote a cow, start a, start a fever. <laughs> that kind of makes up for the tune out drop in. An ordinary man always has a collective to back up what he thinks. Those who know need no one. A visitor to earth was astounded after being here a few days to learn that men are not intentionally boring. Men become important in one of two ways, either by what they've done or by what they've thought. Does the imbalance between the two suggest anything to you? The loneliness of the long distant, distant mystic. He has no one to be pissed at but himself. The difference revisited. The mind is like a train that never stops. Consciousness isn't. One father's comment to his son, if you're not aware of what you're thinking, don't be calling yourself thinking. <laughs> One man sighed and said, I'd forget my head if it wasn't screwed on. 
To which the few would reply, ah, but don't you wish. <laughs> Once upon a time, a man found a wondrous cap, but immediately decided it was not all that wondrous and didn't pick it up and walked on off somewhere. <laughs> Moral, tell or relive the same story twice at your own peril. Okay, back to the veracity and verbiage. Grow up and face it. There's no such thing as peril. <laughs> there's being alive and there's being dead. That's it. And no peril possible in between. Well, okay, sure. It's not so for those trying to live through extraordinary times, but they're too few to use as a basis for an exception. And one man sighed, jeez, I'd forget what this whole damn story was about if it wasn't right here screwed to the paper. <laughs> <coughs> Would someone punch Bach and tell him that the sleepers remain in their unshaken condition? <laughs> a visitor to a mystical school, which had never had an official name, said to the head monk, why don't you just call yourselves the superior people? since that's what you believe you are. And in the attempt to be agreeable, the monk replied, all right, we are the superior people. And the man spat back, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> and the monk thought, he's right, that's an even better name. <laughs> the thinking of the more conscious doesn't agree with anyone else's for the same reason that life doesn't agree with men. It simply absorbs them. <laughs> well, it seems as though news items are back again, having to do, at least tonight, with radio stations. <laughs> By my best count, there were at least four in there, but the man who referred to his mind as a pocket radio and although it didn't shut it off, it helped remind him of the fact that what he was picking up, he wasn't transmitting. Now I remind you of one of our new scientific statements that if you do not know that life is alive, nothing makes sense. And if you do, everything does. But between here and there, the mind, besides all the wondrous things that it has done with manipulating the environment, the mind continues to try and explain the nature of itself. It normally says man, as you might. It's not too early to go off on a sidetrack, is it? <laughs> all of the attempts, historically, all of the attempts of men apparently trying to explain life, philosophically, religious, and scientific, blah, blah, blah. if you'll think about it in a certain way, they're not trying to explain the nature of man. They're not trying to explain life. They always say that. They always say that. They're trying to explain, it's the mind trying to explain itself. And the only time you ever hear that even broached is in psychology almost as a offhand statement that they say, well, we are studying it. And of course, neurology says it's studying the brain, but they deny that they have any interest in the mind and they, people still won't discuss. Is the mind actually connected in some way with the brain? Well, prove it. Prove it to me, sir. You do not have any, you never had, philosophers, novelists, dramatists, people in the arts. You have never had people to any degree that made the history books, that made collective consciousness. You've never had people saying that the attempt of art, the attempt of religion, the attempt of philosophy, is the greatest umbrella to cover it all, they never say anything other than, well, they never say that they're attempting to explain the mind. As always, we're attempting to explain, and then it's several versions, but it's the same thing if you ask them or if you ask yourself. They'll say, well, what I'm attempting to do with my art, with my drama, with my philosophy, just my survey, my study of life itself. I'm attempting to find out how long will man continue to have to make hand gestures to try and bring over certain points. 
Someday I'm going to find I guess, say something about that other than make apparent jokes. <laughs> Can men talk without gestures? Yes. Do they ever? No. Does that tell you anything? Oh. <laughs> Would that not be, how about a sidetrack from a sidetrack? As intelligent, as mentally driven as are modern day sophisticated people, you do realize that hand gestures are not simply, I'm sure there's somebody around tried to make a, a small reputation sociologically or psychologically about hand gestures and I can just imagine right now somewhere there's been some papers surely written that it's uh, an offshoot of a man's subconscious mind that in some way if people make gestures they're probably trying to ward off their uncle who tried to sexually attack them or they're making gestures like what they're really saying is wishing their mother to love them more. <laughs> Forget all that. The hand gestures are communication. It's not anything subconscious, and it's not anything from a man's hoary, forgotten individual past. It is from man's past, but it is, even today, what I was going to say, even today people still make gestures, and it is a holdover from, in a sense, a viable holdover from our animal nature of all the things, because animals, even though they can squeal and make a noise to warn people about this and that, the main way that non-intellectual creatures communicate, obviously, is physical. Punch each other, make a face, curl up their teeth, and supposedly they're a certain pack of dogs somewhere near the Arctic Circle, I don't know this, that have actually taken up and do a few paw gestures. <laughs> there are no films of it, and only one very blurry still shot, so. <laughs> I cannot vouch for it, but at any rate, it, it would be easy enough, which I keep doing little things and making jokes, as you notice about it, but it is a form of communication, and although people do it without thinking about it, but at least you think that that is still some psychological explanation. How about this? People talk without thinking about it. <laughs> and suddenly, anyone who's been watching this show, trying to watch it seriously on TV, <laughs> has just begun to pull out their channel surfer and went, <laughs> because no one wants to hear that. You can hear, I guess if anybody had been sitting around here with an ordinary mind, they could take the several and many jokes I've made or suddenly aside about gestures as, well, that's an attack on people just doing things unconsciously. <laughs> that I was making some comment or maybe even trying to excuse them why myself that here I'm talking about consciousness and being in control of one's mind and even in the midst of me talking about it I'm making gestures like an ordinary and it's like well now wait a minute every now and then he catches himself and so then he makes it like a little joke and maybe to even defuse it and you could take it a certain way and even believe I'm talking for an ordinary person that I make the little joke just to show that I actually do that consciously or else I wouldn't even make the joke about it. It's very complicated. See, there's... <laughs> at least anybody thinks that gestures are not... There are all kinds of things that gestures can do like that that would take you five minutes verbally with a vocabulary of you know, probably over, well over two or three hundred words. It would still take you a couple of minutes. There are things that you can describe and go... And you know immediately. <laughs> and, you, and if you just had to stand here and describe what you were trying to talk about, about. <laughs> um, we're getting close probably to 10 or 15 minutes to try. If it's you and one person with your hands in your pockets, so that you say, I'm going to describe something. Uh, <laughs> back to, it would be easier for a person to think that there was some uh, intent on my part having to do with pointing out how much of man's life is run in contradiction of what they may have thought I was already saying is run by a subconscious or unconscious, since Freud's not here to argue the point, which are one you like, of non-conscious drives is what makes a man do something like that. <laughs> and then I'm making some comment or attempting to that, uh-huh, that just shows you. 
that might, no matter how intelligent you are, no matter how many courses you've taken on how to control your mind, how to appear to be intelligent, although ellipsis, that I was making some comment about, well, that's an unconscious thing. Who in the hell needs to make an attack on gestures as being non-conscious? <laughs> that's why the people tuned out. To back up, I'm going to repeat myself. Who the hell cares? A, we hadn't even, How long is it going to take to get around to how unconscious that is with ordinary people? How conscious is this thought? And people go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Are you talking? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> Will we ever find our way back without the breadcrumbs? <laughs> <clears throat> All right. We'll make one of those nice scientific quantum leaps right back to where, somewhere close to where we were. It is the continuing attempt of the mind while saying, I was going to give the variations, it's not, that men have said throughout history and under all kinds of conditions, historians, anybody who talked, anyone who was literate, anyone who thought they had anything to say that we now remember, they could say, well, I'm attempting to make sense of history. It was uh, Herodotus. I'm attempting to make sense of human relationships, if it was Shakespeare. I'm attempting to understand the physical world, if it was Aristotle. They can say all of these things, but they are attempting one thing. It is the mind attempting to explain itself. The body is not going to attempt to explain itself. There's nothing to explain. It is self-explanatory. <laughs> when you do that, what, else, what are you going to say? Now, ordinary people, another person, if they don't like the gesture, they may wait and hope you're going to say something like, well, nothing personal. Because they might take it as an aggressive sign, like, hey, I am right, and that's it. And they hope that something will follow from the mind, such as, I don't mean you personally. But notice, nowhere, one more time let me point out, no psychology said originally, and philosophy did originally, that they were there, that they wanted to investigate the mind, and Kant and some of the people said that. They will say it, because I guess it, to them it sounded to be a very intelligent-sounding preface. And they'd say, I am here, this, this will be my magnum opus. I am, my one interest in life is to investigate the workings, the nature, the promise, the purpose of the human mind. And that's his preface. Page one. Absolutely forgotten. It never arises again in any specific form. It is only hit in passing. But it is the mind attempting to explain itself. Uh, uh, what's the gesture for uh? In fact, that's even better, isn't it? Uh sounds kind of like what it is, uh, that you don't know what you're doing or you lost your place or you're too, you don't know what to say next. It just sounds, if I may admit, it's, it sounds less than intellectually inspiring to your listeners. <laughs> it sounds less than intellectually flattering to you to go, uh, but notice this. No, no sound, just now gestures. Same thing, you don't know what you're doing, you lost your place or you don't know what to say and you go, I'm hoping I pulled it off. It is. You look thoughtful, reflective. <laughs> it's like you're pondering that you know exactly what you want to say next, but that you're trying to form it in just the right way, and you go, well, that's a lot better than, uh, uh, uh. There was, back to where you were. There is a purpose for me trying to make this very clear. Think about it. I'm not trying to prove a point. It's just the reality of what life has been thus far. The mind and all of human literature, all of the arts, almost everything it does, this side of technology, which I could prove that it's the same thing, but I always try to leave you one little rat hole so that you can take on any possible exceptions that comes to mind if you never noticed. That's what your mind wants anyway. You want one little weak spot. In my Barbie doll of truth, justice, and an enlightened explanation of what's going on, or my liver loaf, you want one little bad spot, you want one little bruise on an apple, 
You want one rat hole so that the mind can think, even while I'm talking, and at first your mind goes, uh-oh, he got us again, and you immediately think up an exception and hope that I'm going, well, never mind these kind of exceptions. No. If I don't do that, at least you've got a place your mind can go, well, in case we don't like where it's going, it's like it pushes <laughs> what it perceives to be an exceptional piece of cheese that I overlooked into that rat hole. Like, <laughs> if this goes any further and I dislike it as much as I do now, I can always go back because I can see an exception. Uh, that's from Plato. I know it's, it's obscure. It did not make, it didn't make the Western translation cut that we normally get in the translations. Of, but it was a little something he had to do with trying to figure out how many species of actual flowers there were as opposed to just weeds. Anyway, he was trying to describe it. Did everything the mind does this side of technology, that's your rat hole case you think that the mind does do everything else other than producing air conditioning and uh, synchronized transmission in cars yeah. that kind of thing other than that the mind has been engaged in one thing all the way from religion politics and I'm not talking about fighting over territory I'm talking about all of this the ideas of politics the ideas of conflicting theories of hand gestures not of hand gestures <laughs> of political systems economic models all of this all you got to do is see it, and it leads you somewhere. Maybe. Sure. That it is all one and the same thing. At least you think it's only me that takes one idea and talks about it forever from a million different ways. The mind's been doing that. I only stole it, the idea. The mind has been doing that by saying, well, let's talk about politics. Well, wait a minute. Let's consider, instead of politics, we beat that one to death. But let's maybe take a breather. Let's consider the kinds of strategies that seem to work, the kind of conflicts that seem to arise among people, not just on a political basis, but once it started political, if you'll notice, we're inside a system, even beyond, uh, before the point of some clear national boundaries being uh, drawn out, that if they have what appears to be political difficulty, and I know we've discussed it, but let's consider it will also very shortly rise into the artistic realm. And first thing you know, even had they lived together in those 12 days, religiously free, even that will arise. It's all the same thing. They're not talking about politics. I know they think they are. They're not talking about economics. They're not talking about uh, nationalistic interests. They're not talking about religious differences. It's the mind attempting to explain itself, but the mind cannot do it. And in a sense, the mind, there's two ways you can look at it, according to how, as they say nowadays, according to how desperate you are for some good self-image. The mind cannot explain itself, for two, or the mind does not get involved for two reasons. One is it's too stupid to. The other is it's not equipped to, which, well, another way to put it, it never thinks to, which is the same thing. All right, they're both the same thing. But the mind never says, other than that one little area that people will state, that I'm going to investigate the workings of the human mind, right. And forget it. When, if they even try it, as soon as a man starts attempting to do it, he realizes this is going nowhere, and he doesn't really know why, hmm. which I did cover it, probably less than 50 words a night, that if your mind, if your, if your consciousness, if your mind is only run by what it thinks, if it takes mooing to be the only thing of which it's capable, then what it's like, the mind trying to study itself and explain itself, is a tree trying to climb itself. Mm -hmm. And a man, an ordinary man, that includes everybody, just using your mind as best you can, if you sit there and think, all right, how could I, you can take it as a challenge, how could I explain the workings of the mind? You will start using statistics. God, even worse, if you're really stupid, which everybody's mind is, you'll very shortly fall upon, God, where will I go with this? I stated I was going to make my speech tonight. They're all waiting there, all those important people, that I was going to explain the human mind its workings, its purpose, its promise for tomorrow, or some shit like that. And the man suddenly realizes, and he's the world's most famous expert on the mind. He pointed himself that. Or he's announced that's going to be the title of his new book, and so everyone assumes, since no one else is, that you, it's like wanting to believe that if you're sick, you want to believe in faith healers. If you're really sick, you want to believe, if you're ordinary, that, ah, when people die, what was that thing that used to say you didn't die? Yeah, religion. I'll go get religious. A man can say, I'm going to explain the human mind. 
he could announce that as his topic, the title of his book. He could say, that's going to be my life work. And that's good for assuming he's got any intelligence, just ordinary wits about him. It's going to be good for probably at best if he really applies himself and sits there at the typewriter. <coughs> I don't have statistics, but probably five or ten minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's pushing it. That's going, getting several cups of coffee, going to the bathroom, <laughs> picking hairs out of his nose, <laughs> looking out the window, <laughs> picking up the phone, making sure it's buzzers and the <laughs> dial tone. <laughs> on. But he's going to sit there. All you got to do is think about yourself. If you were suddenly confronted, and it was a very important occasion, and you had volunteered to ask you, would you say something, would you speak to us tonight on the matter of the workings of the human mind? Just a nice, simple explanation. Very shortly, if a man's got any walking around sense, he just draws an absolute blank. He may start trying to look in other books. He may have he look in the encyclopedia under the mind. It's going to talk about everything except the mind. It's going to talk about the brain. It's going to talk about neural juices. It's going to talk about rats and mazes. It's going to talk about statistics. And what I started to say, if he really slips, here we go. After he realizes, I, there's nothing I can say, and I don't know why. I've got an IQ in the high two or three percentile of the country, of the world. I have studied psychology, philosophy. I'm as well read as anyone on this planet. But I cannot think of one thing. Oh, I got it. Doesn't understand anything about the mind. But that cannot stop an ordinary person. You know what he'll do? He will suddenly come up with a personal anecdote. And then he can get going because he'll tell the crowd, all right, the title, the announced topic of my speech was The Human Mind, A Plain View Thereof. And ladies and gentlemen, as I sit there thinking about it, there have been many, many attempts. I won't, I won't carry that much further, but you understand if you draw out a preface long enough, a teaser about what's coming up after commercial, you can keep doing that and suddenly go, well, my time's up. So I won't carry that. So I just do it shortly. The guy says, well, I was sitting there in my study. And as much as I have read, and as much as I may humbly say so, and recognize as being a serious thinker myself, and my many published works in several various fields, but even I, even I, as I sit there, realize that there, there are immediate, very, challenging difficulties in attempting to explain the human mind. And so I sat and I pondered. And I thought of many ways to begin this. And I thought, what well, the simplest is, is this. Here's what's funny. My wife told me the other day, when I was going out to the store, she says, whatever you do, we have important people. And he'll tell a personal anecdote for those of you that still do not understand the pugnacious, if not anti-poignant, perfume or personal anecdotes because not only can he you can spring from one personal anecdote and kill up and kill 45 minutes and use up his speech but if you start it with a personal anecdote once you bring it up almost everyone in the audience they go into a kind of there's no real term for it so I'll have to, it's like a personal anecdotal daze <laughs> It's like even if you were there and you went and you paid your money or somebody drugged you, well, you went there and it's going to be a speech on the human mind and you just know it's going to kill you. <laughs> You're going to break out in a sweat. You're going to be in need of a, desperate need of a drink within 30 or 40 minutes. But if the guy will start off and he'll tell a personal anecdote, it's like suddenly there's someone in the audience doing it. It's like you can lay back and you're in a pool on a float and you go, ah. <laughs> and you just, you just kind of drill. Because if you bring it down to a personal anecdotal level, maybe I should try to make it plainer what's involved, what you have done in a socially acceptable and distracting manner is to admit that you've got nothing to say. <laughs> it is one way to keep from going, uh, uh, especially for 45 minutes for your whole announced period of your speech. A personal anecdote is literally... I've never been this harsh with you, but you asked for it. You've been an unruly crowd. I don't have time to slap everyone's hand with a ruler. Plus, the head nun took the big ruler. A personal anecdote is an admission of ignorance. That is all it is. And any sane, reasonable person hearing that would dismiss it. But you think about it. And it goes on. It is so much a part 
and it's back to what I was talking about originally, believe it or not, of the mind cannot explain itself. And the most probably, now I think about it, I don't have the statistics with me, I don't think, but yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I forgot. It's somewhere in there. I just thought they were here. Of the popularity of personal anecdotes. But you never notice. But I point to you again, turn on the TV, if that will help. The president, <laughs> the president will be up there, the head of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, the Secretary of War. I'm talking about be something serious that the newscaster says uh, it's been announced that uh, such and such country has got troops, again, close to an area in which we have our own vital interests. It can sound like something very important, and so we now switch live right quick to the White House where we have the Secretary of So-and-so or the President. Maybe I pushed it too far for an example. <laughs> but they will take something extremely important. I shouldn't have said war because that gets too close to the movements of human bodies and you can get by. When you start talking about death, people don't really expect much intelligence if they're faced with the possibility that you may be drafted and sent there. So let's take it back to money, social welfare, social reform, social problems. And I say, well, here it is. Uh, Congress has come up. They have finally decided to bring up the idea of the poor and indigent in our country and uh, the Speaker of the House or the Vice President. Somebody says, we have finally come up with a program, and here it is. And so he announces, we're going to suggest so-and-so and a reporter. Somebody says, well, could I ask you this? And they ask him a question. He got no idea what he's talking about. And I don't mean just because somebody else wrote his speech. They ask any question like, well, do you think we're ever going to get actually, I mean, the program sounds fine, Mr. Secretary, Mr. President. That program, I'm not saying that. Let's not even get into specifics. But let me ask you this larger question. Do you think that as a government, do you think as a people, civilized people, do you think we will ever, rather than just having to deal with the symptoms of poverty, do you think that as a people in this day and age that we will ever get to the root cause of poverty or ignorance or bad hairdos? No, nah, social, stuff that sounds important. And the president got no idea. He may have just read this great program they put together. And we're going to spend more and more money and do this and that. And somebody says, what, what they're asking is, can you explain what you understand about this? And he doesn't understand anything. And I don't mean just because he's the president. Because well, we won't be fair. Just because you're a politician, that doesn't mean you're dumber than everybody else. I mean, not necessarily. It, you could be just at the ordinary level of dumbness. You're probably not going to go very far in politics, but it's not that you're necessarily dumber. But they asked the president. They asked the secretary of education or whatever. And he'll go, and you say, you're not even aware of it. You never notice. And he'll go, well, he, he says, I know that it's been a long, hard struggle for civilization. Many minds, probably better than ours, have worked on this problem for thousands of years about poverty. But all right, let me tell you this. When we were working this program, we were holding uh, committee meetings down in, uh, it was Dallas. It was Dallas. And we, this little old lady came in with a shopping bag and asked to be heard. <laughs> what he's admitting is, I have no idea what to say. I don't know anything about this. I've told you everything I know. I shouldn't be answering questions. <laughs> and you'll tell a personal anecdote. Now, it's all the way from that. If I didn't cloud that up too much. It is going on continually. You never notice it. And from an ordinary view, if someone was listening to this, they could defend it and say all sorts of things. I can do it. Well, this brings a human interest to it. It puts a human face on cold statistics, on cold pieces of legislation. It puts a human spin, a face on it, so that we can see what the problems are. Like they've been hiding. We've got to go look for problems. They can explain it all they want to, but a personal anecdote is an admission that I do not know anything. I can't answer your question. I don't know, but I am not going to stand here. I did not get to be appointed Secretary of Education just because I fell off the back of a Greyhound bus. I'm not going to stand here and go, uh, gee, I don't know. All I got to do is think real quick, and I'll think up some story I read or somebody told me, and I'll change it around. He remembers the Secretary of Housing told a story similar at a breakfast two days ago, and he'll go, I'll change it. That was in Denver. I'll change it to Dallas. And he said it was an old man with a beard, a homeless person. So I changed it to an old lady with a shopping bag. But as soon as you say, all right, 
this reminds me of a woman who came in to our last hearing. And everybody goes, <laughs> it has apparently made it human in some way. It is an admission of ignorance. And before we laugh anymore at politicians, as well deserved as it may be, all you have to do is look in your own rotunda, look at the, own, the driveway in front of your own White House right here, and every time you can't think, what the hell is going on, what do you do? You come up with a damn personal anecdote. You do it to you, you do it to others. It's always, up until now, I can always say, well, it's easier when to see it in others, but, you know, if you're going to take these away out for everyone, one guy told his kid tonight, right there in the news, I didn't make it up, folks, in the news, he told his kid, he said, if you're not aware of what you're thinking, don't be calling what you do thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave it to you. But you are continually, everybody, husbands, wives, lovers, family, close friends, you are constantly doing personal anecdotes, which if you want to see it in a certain way, is almost, it's kind of obscure, but these are obscure times in which we live. <laughs> personal anecdotes are a mild form, verbally, of <laughs> hand gestures. You tell personal anecdotes. You tell personal anecdotes to explain behavior, to uh, try and ward off guilt and evil spirits, criticism, because many people seem to be sharp enough that they have the ability to refrain from an outright whine or from an abject plea for leniency. <laughs> for instance, the boss comes in and goes, and he looks down your desk and goes, that report, I told you that report had to be in two hours ago. Good God! And you realize, uh-oh, no, I'm about to be fired. And what do you do? In other words, and he looks at you like, what, what have you got to say? And of course, you've got nothing to say other than I'm stupid and you can't do that. So what do you do? <laughs> Now, I know they're oftentimes referred to as lies or excuses, but in what form are they? They're always, you don't come up with statistics. You don't come up with a scientific law. He says, how can you be that stupid? You've worked for me 10 years. You've been here. You worked too. How can you be that stupid when you knew that thing had to be on? You could be costing us millions. How could you be that stupid? The man is not going to say, well, according to the latest statistics, I saw well over 87% of people in my position in this country are stupid. No, you can't do that. You can't suddenly try to come up with some unknown tenth law of thermodynamics as, as to why a man in your position, sometimes, you know, the heat rushes out of his head and equilibrium is such that causes him to be stupid. Uh-uh. You know all that. What's he going to do? He's going to tell a personal anecdote. You know damn well he is. You would too if you're ordinary. He's going to go, boss, I did tell you my wife may have cancer, didn't I? <laughs> you know? You'll tell a person like, or you'll say, I was working on that report. And you'll try to think of some underling, maybe that's already having problems there that has a drinking, a reputation for drinking. And you'll go, I finished that report and gave it to Johnson. Where the hell is he? <laughs> now, I know that's usually passed off as a chief excuse in that shutter, but I want you to see, consider that they all fall within the realm of personal anecdote. Now back to where you were. The mind cannot explain itself. Think about that. You've got to get some grasp on that notion of how I started this. It, it, is not, it does not even try. Ordinary people do not try. Uh, a little side note again. In fact, there are instances, some of them are historically remembered, of people who did give it a shot of actually trying to describe the mind, but the only reason they're remembered are as examples of anomalies verging on insanity. No. Think about it. I'm not going to tell you which ones, but most of you are well read enough. They're little bits that have survived historically that they'll go, you know, this guy was obviously, he had some sort of talent, whether it is writing, painting, was normally writing. And they'll say he had some ability, but you know, <laughs> There was something so bizarre. In other words, this one piece that we've saved is like an example of here's what not to let happen to yourself. When it was a fair shot compared to everything else. I'm not trying to make you go back and look for something that has anything of importance. But those who actually give it a shot, it's normally not even heard, seen, or remembered. But if it is, it's on the basis of don't let this happen to you. you know, don't actually try it. Tell a personal anecdote for God's sake. <laughs> the personal anecdote, to expand it back out in a full sense of it, that is 
the cultural, civilized legacy of humanity. What is our religion? I mean, from top to bottom. We're not talking about the physical aspects of lighting candles or praying and prayer breeds. We're not talking about the physical discipline. What is the philosophy? What is the non-physical reality of politics, religion? They're personal anecdotes. They're no longer thought of that. But that's all they are. That is the mind's best shot at explaining life, which I'm already telling you is the mind attempting to explain itself. The mind is not attempting to explain life. But the mind will not, under ordinary conditions, if you read a man's novel, let's say, and you, or listen to his symphony, you did something, you go, not only was that enjoyable to read as a novel, not only was that enjoyable to sit and to let the music wash over me, but I feel as though you intended something else. Perhaps it was an allegory of some sort. And he will go, be pleased to hear that, and go, yes. He will never, if you say, well, what, what's the general purpose? I don't want you to take it apart for me. I know that ruins an allegory and somebody trying it, but just generally, would you tell us, tell me or tell us if you're a reporter, would you just, what is it you were attempting through this novel besides the pleasure of the story itself? We've already established that there, it can be taken to another level. He smiles, yes. Well, what is it? And everyone always says, well, it's my attempt in my own way to try and give some insight into the nature of human existence. No, it's not. No. The mind got, it does not give one rat's damn <laughs> ass for human existence, the nature of life, what might be God's purpose for us. Take anything you want to. It is the mind wanting to do one thing. It's a tree wanting to climb itself. <laughs> what else has the mind got to be interested in? I know, as always, there seems to be that runs in so many directions or goes sideways and you're not sure. It's really plain. If you'll first, not we're at the end, if you'll accept there's a working premise, it's actual fact, <laughs> that this is all the mind does, no matter what it's called. But look at the many areas, religion, myths, history, and forget the idea of any physical aspect such as religion. We're not talking about religion of a physical uh, ritual. Everything non-physical, the dreamy part, the stories, the theology of it. It is the mind attempting to explain itself because the mind has no interest in anything else. <laughs> the mind, the mind's not interested in what's going on in the liver. Yeah. Unless, it's up, unless it's swelling up or about to burst or something, then you get scared of death. But the mind has no interest in the world of the body. If it does, it is a complete irrelevant interest because the body does not need the mind's help. Contraire. <laughs> what the, but see, here's what is very difficult to see. Well, it's easy to see once you see it, but it's hard to keep in mind because there is no proof. All I can try to do is you know, verbally slap you around for 50 minutes and you keep thinking, well, maybe, maybe that, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe. The mind has one interest, itself. And all you got to do is sit and try to explain the mind. Just start writing a coherent page. Not just coherent, but it has some meaning that you could show to some other human, some other reasonable person, and they'd read it and go, well, that is, that is relevant. That is, that's important. That's informative. That's interesting. That's, I never thought about that. It can't be done. You can tell a personal anecdote that the human mind, what a wondrous thing it is. I had an uncle who had an IQ of 140, and then a brick fell on his head from a scaffolding. And now he cannot even tie his shoes because of one small brick that just glanced off his head. The end. And people read that and go, and if you ask them, well, why were you impressed by that? And they'll say something. If they're intelligent at the ordinary level, they'll say something like, well, it just shows the fragility. It shows the ephemeral nature. It shows the thin line between or his uncle. Let me give you an example. That story, his uncle. I'm, I'm assuming he's telling the truth. He said his uncle had an IQ of 180, that he was a physicist, and that a brick. I mean, it didn't even knock him out. It just hit a glancing blow, and he walked off, and suddenly he got to the corner, and he didn't know where he was. And since then, he can, it's all he can do 
to, he cannot really tie both shoes in the same day. And it just shows, it shows the position of the humanity, how important our mind is. And they go on and on. And then the person that you ask the question, they go, as a matter of fact, my mother, now God, you know, a brick didn't fall on her, but she's got old timer's disease or whatever you call it. And they tell another personal anecdote about she was just sharp as a tack, even her arthritis. I mean, she's now 92 and her arthritis got so bad she could barely get up. But boy, she was sharp. She would watch TV, read, kept up with things. And then suddenly something happened, like it was a mini stroke or something. And just one day, I hadn't seen her about a week, and I walked in and I said, hello, mom. And she looked around like, who are you talking to? You're the guy referring back to the story about the guy's uncle who got hit by a brick. And you listen to all this, and you, if I suddenly jumped into this scene, me or some evil genie, and went, what does all this have to do? How is this informative? How has this helped you? And they would look at you like, well, you, you, you poor dunce. We are just covering as fast as we can talk. We are just, we're just covering wide areas explaining the nature of the human mind. And it damn near sounds you... At the ordinary level, like everything else in the city, the traffic makes noise. And one expert says, that's not just noise. Part of that is an explanation of the nature of God. And sure enough, if you're wired up and want to hear it, you go, well, I'll be down to this. And somebody says, it is also, if you'll listen to that, part of that, that noise out there tells you why Rococo fell before the onslaught of Baroque. Or Baroque <laughs> fell to Rococo. Well, classical fell to romantic music. And you listen, you think, well, I'll be damned. It makes sense. <laughs> Everything makes sense. If you tell a personal anecdote, you fall on your back, you, go, you float along, and after that, it's like you've been dazed. It wasn't the sun. It wasn't a brick. Somebody says, you ask them a question. And they go, well, all right, let me see how I can put this best to you because I, I appreciate the question. It's a good question. All right, all right let, let me try this. Let me tell you about my mother. And it's like they've let you off the hook. You ask a question. It could be dangerous that you stood up and you asked the expert a question. There it is. People looked at you. And what if the son of a bitch actually began to answer it and maybe looked at you like, well, do you understand that? And maybe ask you a question. And you, you at first think, God, I wish I hadn't asked that. What if there's a test later? Or what if he answers my question and looks at me and makes me nod? And he says, did I answer it? And you go, well, yeah. And what if later my girlfriend or a stranger walks up to me outside the door to me and goes, God, what a great question. And I couldn't believe he'd spent that time answering it to you, but I'm going to tell you it was above my head. Would you give me, you nodded, you understood it. Would you tell me what he meant? <laughs> but you feel great relief that the expert says, that is a darn good question. In fact, that is, that's right at the heart of my feel. That, in fact, out of all my years of teaching and writing, I'm not sure anyone's ever put it as succinctly as that. So whew, you, you, you have cut right to the heart of the whole area of my expertise. So... And uh, no offense, but, you know, we're talking about years of training and study. Let me see how I can put it. All right, let me tell you this. Let me tell you what happened to my mother. <laughs> and you suddenly are so relieved because you know it's like somebody, like a faith healer with this heavy-handed that prays for people and goes, yeah. it's like he kind of dazed you and you just fall back. You're not healed of anything, but you're off the hook <laughs> because you know he's not going to answer the question. And so, therefore, he can't turn to you and say, you do understand it, don't you? Yeah. It's like you have both now entered into a secret pact. Yeah. He doesn't understand what's going on. The audience doesn't. And he says, well, let me, all right, let me, let me tell you what happened to my mother. And everybody who's been paying attention feels a certain kind of relief, like, oh, thank God, a personal anecdote. In other words, the idea of human stupidity in some way is not going to be suddenly held up in front of us. We paid our way to get in, cleaned up. You know, talk about a bad evening's entertainment, but everybody feels great relief. In case you ever thought about in another area, uh, back to religion, which seems to be the place that people's always suspected or thought should have been at least out of the ordinary in the public institutions, the public arena, what do they do? If you grew up around religion, which everybody did, you're used to hearing it in another way, whether it's your religion or not. You hear it as mystical myths, or you hear it as absolute what happened to prophets of God, what happened to spokesmen of Allah. What are they? They're down personal anecdotes. <laughs> It's so that the, the religion, it's so the people involved don't have to say, well, I know that we raised these millions of dollars, we've got this fine thing here, and you bought me nice uniforms, we've got all kinds of doodads up here, and all kinds of fancy gold stuff, and I know what's going to happen. It's taken us 20 years to get this place, and I know, sure as hell, one of you son of a bitch is going to ask me, what's the nature of life or something? 
And of course they are. That's the whole point of it. And, he's, and somebody says, yeah, I was just going to ask that. And the priest, the rabbi, whoever it is, the shaman has to go, well, all right. You've got to admit, that is the question. That's the question central to every right-thinking person's mind. And they all go, yeah. So you've got to understand the importance. That is the question. Now they'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the question. There is no question greater than the question, what's the nature of life? And they go, well, yeah, yeah. And he, he goes, all right. But we've got to keep in mind how important it is, how supreme. It's paramount. Yes, yes, yes. They all, and he goes, all right. Here's what the prophet Ezekiel said when faced with the same question. Here's what blessed Muhammad said when someone trapped him next to a camel corral and says, let me ask you this. They tell personal anecdotes. Now back to where we started all this and really didn't press on, didn't we? Everything the mind does is an attempt to explain itself, and it cannot say it, so what does it do other than personal anecdotes, back to where I didn't even get going good, the man who called his mind a pocket radio, and it didn't actually do him any good, you got to fill in the blanks, I said it didn't shut it off, because you're assuming, or I'm assuming you're assuming, that uh, he had some reason for calling the mind something, that he was less than fully pleased with the operations of his mind. So the news line said, one man called his mind, referred to it as a pocket radio, and although it didn't cut it off, didn't shut it off, it did help remind him that what it was picking up, he wasn't transmitting. Mm -hmm. That is what the mind can't explain. That is why a tree cannot climb itself, because a tree's not itself. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why you ask a man, what's that noise coming out of your pocket? Oh. He says, that's no pocket, that's my mind. <laughs> I, I reversed the joke, so the, the way it should have gone is, what's that noise coming out of your mind? And he hopes that you know, he can say, oh, that's not my mind, that's coming out of my radio. At any rate, <laughs> this is all of human civilization, the non-physical part, all of culture. It is the, all of the explanations is men's minds trying to say, where's that noise coming from? What's making me do this? Who's transmitting? And there is no answer. And so they have to tell a personal anecdote and go, well, that's interesting. The mind is sort of like a radio, isn't it? Hey, that's the thing for me now. You ask a man. What caused you to tell, say that to the boss? What caused you to say that to your best friend? Why did you say that to your own child, to your own wife, to your own mother? Why did you say that? Why do you think that? Why do you say that? And if somebody's ordinary, he'll take it as some deserved guilt. And what will he do? Well, of course, obviously tell a personal anecdote. But what is it he's trying to do that he can't do? He can't tell you who's transmitting what he's picking up. You do understand what I mean by picking up. He doesn't know where what he thinks comes from. Well, why didn't you say that to start with? <laughs> You're right. Okay. Well, that's interesting because one time I was talking about this before and a lady in the audience. 